Welcome to this skills master class on the mechanics of the Indian skill ecosystem. The master classes aims to build understanding of India's skill system across the Australian vocational education and training sector, the VET sector. The master classes will support increased participation by Australian VET providers in India's skill system. I am Professor Vinita Sirohi, lead researcher working in the area of skill development and vocational education and training, also holding the position of chairperson, steering committee MPhil PhD program, and chairperson equal opportunity cell at the National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. The National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, deemed to be university, established by the erstwhile Ministry of Human Resource Development, now Ministry of Education, Government of India, is a premier organization dealing with capacity building and research in planning and management of education, not only in India, but also in South Asia. In recognition of the pioneering work done by the organization in the field of educational planning and administration, the Government of India has empowered it to award its own degrees by way of conferring it the status of deemed to be university in August 2006. Like any central university, NEPA is fully maintained by the Government of India. The institute is unique as it is the only institution in the country offering exclusively research programs that is MPhil, PhD and postdoctoral on educational planning and administration, fully funded by the Ministry of Education, Government of India. NEPA is very pleased to partner with the Australia India Institute for their Skills Masterclass Series. The Australia India Institute is an Australian organization that is dedicated to the Australia India relationship. Their work includes research and policy advice supporting the Australia-India education relationship. They receive funding from the Australian Government, Department of Education for projects that support this work. And we acknowledge and thank the Department for their support for this service of Skills Masterclasses. This Masterclass will examine Indian regulatory authorities, institutions, VET trainer programs and qualifications in addition to this, it will also examine skills program financing and the role of industry bodies such as Sector Skills Council and industry associations. It's our privilege to have with us Mrs. Sunita Sanghi, former Principal Advisor, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and former Executive Member, National Council for Vocational Education and Training as the resource person for this master class. Before we begin the class, I would like to briefly introduce her. Mrs. Sunita Sanghi belongs to Indian Economic Service and superannuated as principal advisor in the rank and pay of secretary to government of India. During her career spanning over 36 years, she worked in various federal government ministries and departments of various level in different sectors, that is, Ministry of Labor, Employment, Skill, Development, Planning at National Level in Niti Aayog, and erstwhile Planning Commission, Urbanization, and Education, among others. Mrs. Sunita Sanghi has wide experience in the skilling sector, having worked for more than 15 years in this sector. She was part of the core team preparing National Skill Mission and policy framework, including regulatory frameworks. She has participated in various national, international conferences and presented papers on TIVET and has written extensively on skilling issues in various national and international journals. With this, I now hand over to Mrs. Sanghi for the session, please. Thank you, Vinita Ji. It's indeed my pleasure to deliver this masterclass on mechanics of India's skill ecosystem 
covering key aspects related to regulatory frameworks, trainers program, skill financing, and industry partnership in skilling. These aspects facilitate quality assurance in the ecosystem, which is the motto of the skill policy. Let me contextualize the subject covering India's demographic characteristics and institutional framework governing skill ecosystem. We all know that India enjoys demographic advantage with median age of 28 years and working age population of 62% vis-a-vis -vis the Western economies which are aging. As per the latest estimates, 24 million youths are added every year to the population of which at least 10 to 12 million are added to the workforce who are aspirational, more connected, well informed and increasingly looking at non-conventional forms of employment. The need is to ensure that young and aspirational India has the right set of quality skills to seize the opportunity both nationally and globally. Therefore, access to holistic, lifelong and quality skills is critical to unlock individual mobility and livelihood pathways. To understand how aspirational India is empowered with holistic and lifelong learning, it is necessary to understand the institutional structure of Indian skill ecosystem. We have Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship as the nodal agency with an independent regulator called National Council for Vocational Education and Training and a funding agency, National Skill Development Fund. The ministry has many implementing institutions like Directorate General of Training for long-term skilling through industrial training institutes, national skill training institutes for training of trainers, and regional directorate of skilling and enterprises for coordination at state level. The Central Staff Training and Research Institute facilitates training of master trainers and skill administrators and National Instructional Media Institute for development of instructional material, including question banks. Realizing that the task at hand is among us, both in terms of spending financial resources and covering length and breadth of country in delivery of training and creation of infrastructure, a National Skill Development Corporation was set up by Government of India as a not-for-profit public limited company under public-private partnership model to promote skill development by catalyzing private efforts for creation of large quality and for-profit vocational institutions through funds received from NSDF from Government of India. NSDC also supports systems which focuses on quality assurance, information systems and train the trainer academies either directly or through partnership and creation of appropriate assessment system. Besides these institutions, MSD in sync with policy statement of supporting entrepreneurship has institutions supporting training of entrepreneurs like National Institute for Entrepreneurship and Small Business Development and Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship. There are programs for weaker sections who are otherwise not able to have skill training through Jan Shikshan Sansthan covering almost all district in the country. Given that India is a diverse country with different requirements across geography, target groups, depending upon their social, educational, and economic standards, government is implementing various programs to cater to their requirements. These programs covers neoliterate, school dropouts, school goers, youths entering higher education, and youths who are neither in education nor in labor market and implements standardized qualifications with robust assessment mechanism. Having discussed the institutional structure, 
and also various instruments that governments are implementing to ensure availability of appropriate training program for all, it is necessary to understand some of the critical aspects of skill ecosystem impacting the quality of training to know the mechanic of Indian skill ecosystem. The motto of Indian skills ecosystem is quality assurance and not quality control. The key areas to be addressed for quality assurance in vocational education includes effective regulation, central and state level, availability of adequately trained teachers, availability of market relevant qualification, industry participation and adequate financing for creation of infrastructure and delivery of training. Addressing these concerns involves streamlining regulatory arrangements, quality assurances of qualifications, streamlining assessment methods, processes, and capacity building of assessors engaging with industry, etc. Let me begin with regulatory framework. In the Indian context, where most training is financed through government budgetary resources, there is need for an independent regulatory mechanism working at arm's length from the government to address the issue of likelihood of collusion between providers of training and those certifying and assessing the trainees. A look at the regulatory framework Prior to December 2018, it shows a very fragmented structure with short-term training and long-term training governed by different agencies with National Skill Development Agency called NSDA and National Council for Vocational Training called NCVT, respectively. A third layer in terms of sector skill councils through NSDC helped in affiliation of training partners, supervision, assessment, and awarding certificates. A fourth layer of state council for vocational training governed state level training. The need for an independent regulator was felt who would help in separation of governments, public funding, and regulatory functions similar to other sectors like finance. It was also felt that the consolidation of fragmented system would facilitate clarity of functions, better outcomes by establishing uniform minimum standards for various entities functioning in skill ecosystem and their effective monitoring, administrative efficiency in achieving outcomes through delegated system of regulation, increased reach of vocational education and training in underserved and unserved areas, introduction of information enabled, choice based system for trainees and other stakeholders and inclusion of rejects of education system, the vulnerable groups. Hence, in 2018, this Fragmented structure at federal level was consolidated with formation of National Council for Vocational Education and Training called NCVET for both long-term and short-term training to promote a credible learner-centering skilling ecosystem by creating uniform standards, protecting and promoting learners' interest and enabling market-driven innovative solutions. There are efforts at the provincial level also to consolidate the regulatory structure on the lines of federal structure. NCVET represents an institutional reform to improve the quality and market relevance of skill development programs, lending credibility to vocational education and training 
and encouraging greater private investment and employer participation in skilling. The next important question is, how does NCVET achieve its mandate of improving quality of skill training with learner centricity? To achieve its mandate, NCVT has drawn up its agenda. The agenda includes recognizing and regulating awarding bodies, assessment agencies, skill universities, skill information providers, ensuring uniformity in learning outcomes for all trainees, improving assessment certifications and training standards, rating and grading of agencies for providing choice, learners' mobility through national credit framework, multi-skilling and cross-sectoral qualifications to ensure that the changing labor market requirements are addressed. This agenda is sought to be achieved through discharge of four primary functions by NCVET. Is regulating quality through recognition and regulation of skill-related entities such as awarding bodies, assessment agencies, skill universities, and skill information providers. Approving market-relevant qualifications to ensure industry participation, supervising and monitoring skill entities and indirect regulation of vocational training institutes training partners through awarding bodies and assessment agencies, providing a robust grievance redressal mechanism to learners and other stakeholders. To achieve this mandate, the regulator is guided by the principles of learner centricity, digital first with paperless, presenceless interactions to operate at scale, adaptive, evidence-based, and forward-looking with decisions based on real-time data, promoting innovative solutions using technologies. Collaborative, open, and transparent with adequate disclosure and feedback mechanism and minimalistic and user-friendly uniform standards and compliance processes for all entities. Now, let me discuss how NCVET proposes to implement these principles and achieve its agenda by regulating awarding and assessment agencies, which are the pillars of quality skilling. NCVT has notified the guidelines to regulate the functioning of awarding bodies engaged in vocational education and training covering both long-term and short-term training in sync with its mandate. The guidelines clearly define the eligibility criteria in terms of legal status, whether society or company or NGO, financial viability in terms of its net worth, sectoral credibility experience in terms of industry experts on its panel, qualification development, infrastructure, etc. The continuation criteria in terms of industry partnerships, qualification relevance in sync with market, training, data management of qualifications of trainees and delegated regulation of training partners and assessment agencies, etc. The initial recognition of the awarding body is for three years after making payment of rupees 1 lakh Indian rupees. A foreign entity can also be an awarding body by adhering to norms such as application must be made by an Indian subsidiary registered in India. The entity must adhere to Foreign Contribution Regulation Act provisions, guidelines and norms. The entity should not have been blacklisted by any Indian government body, public sector undertaking, autonomous bodies or any other regulatory body in India. There are 
well-defined parameters, processes, and templates with fixed responsibility and timelines for standardized operations and outcomes of the awarding body. Due diligence is done by NCVT to ensure that awarding bodies demonstrate required sustainable capacity and continuation criteria ensures continuity of an awarding body based on its performance against the monitoring and evaluation parameters. The next question is about the scope and categorization of awarding bodies. An awarding body could be qualification based, it could be sectoral or territorial based and also can be categorized as standard recognition only for certification purposes, dual recognition for both assessment and certification or for imparting vocational education in schools in sync with new education policy. NCVT promotes self-regulation by inculcating the culture of self-improvement in the operations of an awarding body in order to improve their risk rating. The monitoring of awarding body is done on annual and continuous basis. The continuous monitoring is done against more than 30 monitoring parameter which leads to risk rating of an awarding body. The functional rating parameters for risk rating of an awarding body includes financial viability in terms of ongoing viability of accounts and operations, data management and technology to capture student uptake and dropout rates for courses, trained staff for training, impartiality of assessments, industry engagement, probity for prevention of any malpractice or maladministration. The risk mapping of an awarding body is done once a year where awarding body is adjudged as being low, medium or high risk. Based on total risk score it obtains, the total risk score for an awarding body is calculated as total risk score equal to sigma weightage into risk score of each parameter. NCVET take action based on risk level and frequency of occurrence. In low risk case, no immediate review action. In median risk prevention plan, along with team to oversee and high risk immediate action is to be identified and undertaken. The improvement action is delineated in a risk mitigation and management plan. Penalties and warnings are imposed as per the decision of NCVET. In extreme cases, there is immediate withdrawal of recognition status which can be considered. NCVT has also entrusted regulation of training partners and assessment agencies to awarding bodies, thereby hinting at futuristic approach of granting more autonomy to awarding bodies. To ensure market relevance of qualifications developed by the awarding body guidelines clearly ensure industry involvement and participation throughout the operation of an awarding body along with a robust grievance redressal mechanism. Post recognition, an awarding body would be able to issue NCVET recognized certificate with national validity in market relevant qualifications through better infrastructure and resources leading to better opportunities in the job market. 
Together with awarding bodies, it is necessary to understand how these awarding bodies ensure effective assessments before providing certification to the learner or trainee. This brings me to the assessment agencies. NCVT has already formulated guidelines for recognition and regulation of assessment agencies to ensure quality in assessment. These guidelines clearly define the contours of the norms of NCVET recognition, setting an overarching governance and effective working principles in line with globally recognized and accredited standards of quality insurance to ensure the identification and sustenance of best-in-class assessment agencies in the skill ecosystem in India. Guidelines clearly define scope in terms of geographical and sectoral-wise specialization, criteria for recognition, tenure in terms of number of years for which recognition is granted, and process of recognition of an assessment agency. The assessment agencies are recognized centrally, keeping in mind separation of awarding and assessment function. There is focus on performance-based categorization of assessment agencies, structured as eligibility and continuation criteria, the guidelines clearly delineate yardsticks on the basis of which recognition shall be granted to an assessment agency while earmarking all criteria that they must continue to fulfill to retain their recognition. These criteria include legal status, financial viability, industry connect, prior experience, infrastructure and assessment tools including business plan, data management strategy, etc. There are various operational models for effective working of assessment agencies. One such model is third party assessment wherein in phase one, awarding bodies have the flexibility to select any assessment agency from pool of recognized assessment agencies based on sector and geography. In phase two, there is random allocation of assessment agencies to training batches through NCVET tech platform. After that, there is no further affiliation of NCVET recognized assessment agencies by the awarding bodies. NCVT rates the assessment agency. The second model is centralized assessment wherein bodies with dual recognition have their own internal mechanism for conducting assessment. These bodies can award and they can also assess. They include government departments, skill universities, etc. Body with dual recognition will be recognized based on the eligibility criteria. The third model is independent assessment centers wherein entities like Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Kendras, International Institute of Skill Training Centers, Industry Skill Centers of Repute, Autonomous Institutes by Government of India to set up independent sector-wise assessment centers. These assessment centers can have tie-ups with the respective awarding bodies to facilitate assessment and certification. The foreign entity desiring to align with NCVET can apply while adhering to FCRA guidelines and norms. However, application must be made by a subsidiary registered in India. They may get into a partnership consortium with an Indian subsidiary. 
In case of consortium, there should be clearly identified lead partner. For the purpose of evaluating performance of assessment agency, NCVT has developed a risk assessment framework to identify risk category of assessment agencies, agencies which continue to show good performance in terms of low risk will be incentivized, whereas those continuously falling in medium on high risk shall be given opportunity for risk mitigation. Having discussed how the awarding bodies and assessment agencies would work for quality assurance, it is necessary to understand the qualification approval process that would be followed by the awarding bodies. The qualification approval is governed by the National Skill Qualification Framework introduced in 2013 as a single unified framework for all qualifications irrespective of awarding bodies. It is a nationally integrated competency-based framework that enables persons to acquire desired competency levels, transit to the job market and at opportune time return for acquiring additional skills to further upgrade their competencies. The framework is operationalized through the National Skill Qualification Committee of the National Council for Vocational Education and Training. The National Council for Vocational Education and Training has framed guidelines for the approval of qualification and it approves qualification in the manner set out in the guidelines. The Council receives proposal for alignment of qualifications to the National Skill Qualification Framework from various awarding bodies, scrutinize it and present them for National Skill Qualification Committee approval. The awarding bodies submit their information in a template called qualification file. With the supporting documents like model curriculum, 30 industry validations, from small, medium and large industries, accreditation and assessment norms, occupational map and evidence of the need for the qualification. After receipt of the qualification file, same is scrutinized in the NCVET and comments are shared with the submitting body. NCVT also holds discussions with all the stakeholders. The comments from stakeholders are provided to the submitting body. After inclusion of the comments, the revised file uploaded in public domain for further comments and feedback from all stakeholders. Once comments are addressed by the awarding body, the final file is submitted to NCVET for approval by National Skill Qualification Committee. Post approval uploaded on the National Qualification Register and those qualifications which are unapproved are returned back to the submitting body. Let me just give you a brief what is a qualification file. A qualification file captures all necessary information like need of the qualification, NSQF levels, notional hours required for that level, entry requirements, progression pathways, relevance of the job, role estimated, uptake, etc. to establish NSQF compliance for a qualification. The question is, what are the advantages of alignment to NSQF? Why should a awarding body align the qualification to the NSQF? NSQF offers several benefits to all the stakeholders, be it trainees, employers, training providers and the governments. When you look at the trainees, they are getting the formal recognition of the experiential learning. They have better access to career opportunities within and across sectors. 
there are opportunities for wage premium for the formerly skilled. Alignment also offer opportunities to trainee for mobility from vocational to general education and vice versa. It also provides mobility opportunities within India and internationally. A trainee can make an informed choice about qualification and training partner. It adds aspirational value to vocational training. The employers have an access to standardized and quality skilled manpower. Their labor productivity improves. There is reduced investment for on-the-job training, especially of the new recruits. There is use of certified high quality labor, which allows firms to access to new business avenues, including export markets. The training providers are also benefited in terms of alignment with industry requirements, greater credibility of institute to target potential trainees. The government of India is benefited in terms of improved labor productivity, equity and equality in access to jobs. There is standardization of qualification across sectors and outcome based approach towards skilling. It facilitates improved return on investment for skilling related expenditure by governments. It also removes stigma from vocational education being low. Recently, in conformity with new education policy, an enabling framework integrating academic education and skilling in India, at all levels of education, including vocational education, thereby breaking all barriers called National Credit Framework has been drafted and launched for public comments. The objective of preparing National Credit Framework is to provide pedagogically innovative combinations, offer multiple entries and multiple exit points and rekindle the principles of lifelong learning in the Indian education system. The framework envisages assigning credit-based value to different levels of learning, including academics, skilling, and experiential learning, accumulating, transferring, or redeeming credits accrued through the academic bank of credit. Equal recognition to curricular, co-curricular, and vocational education, and recognizing the pervasiveness and strengths of online and distance learning modes and accounts for its integration. In a rather novel approach, National Credit Framework gives recognition to prior learning, including informal learning as well, and offers the possibilities of integration from the job market to educational avenues and vice versa. There are guidelines for multi-skilling and cross-sectoral qualification with the objective to acknowledge that new age enterprises roles need cross-sectoral skills to enable a person to perform efficiently and independently. For example, usage of robots in logistics started as a cross-sectoral function, but after a period of time, it has evolved as a line function of logistic industry. This would help in making available industry-ready new job roles in modern and emerging areas with close industrial linkages while infusing the required flexibility and instilling the best practices in the skill ecosystem. Now, the next important question is how these qualifications are transferred or imparted to the trainees, which brings me to the question of vocational trainers program. We all know well-qualified trainers are the cornerstone of quality education and the key determinant of the success of vocational education and training programs. Good training can only be conducted 
if the trainer has comprehensive knowledge, skills and competence in the training occupation. This can be proven with the relevant qualifications and work experience of the trainer. There are various institutions who are providing training to Tibet teachers in India. One such institution is National Skill Training Institutes, which implements the scheme of the Directorate General of Training, Craftsman Instructor Training Schemes for providing training to the trainers through National Skill Training Institutes, which are currently located in most of the provinces in the country. Under the Craftsman Instructor Training Program, comprehensive training both in skills and training methodology is imparted to the instructor trainees to make them conversant with techniques of transferring hands-on skills to train skill manpower for the industry. All candidates must clear All India Common Entrance Test which consists of multiple type questions on a specific trade and open-ended questions measuring logical, numerical, and reasoning ability of a trainee. All students undergoing instructor training must complete a module on training methodology, which covers the topics such as principles of teaching, learning, psychology workshop, administration, motivation, use of computers, and audio-visual aids in teaching. Preparation of lesson plan, etc. Moreover, trainees in engineering trades need to successfully complete a module on engineering technology and two modules on trade technology depending on the trade they are going to specialize in. Trainees in non engineering trades are required to complete a module on vocational calculation and science and two trade skill modules. Trainees must complete the two semester training course within three years of their admission as an eligibility criterion to take the final exam. After completing their training, they undergo All India Final Trade Test and receive a National Craft Instructor Certificate. Second important training institute for teachers is National Institute of Technical Teachers Training and Research, NITER. NITER organize short-term and long-term training programs and webinars and workshops for teachers and staff of the polytechnics, engineering colleges, as well as teachers from overseas to enable them to acquire competencies which are relevant to their respective areas of work. The third important institute is the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education, SEAT, which is an independent center at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, engaged in promoting innovation in school curriculum, teacher education, and higher education curriculum and pedagogy. It acts as catalyst for transformation in teacher education through multiple activities. The center offers long-term programs in Master in Arts Education, B.Ed, M.Ed, Integrated NCTE, Recognized and MPhil and PhD in Education. In the in-service CPD space, SEED currently offers the following short-term courses and programs in blended and online modes. Reflective teaching with ICT for in-service teachers and teacher educators, postgraduate certificate in education perspective and research for teacher educator and administrators. It actively fosters collaborations and invites global expertise to steer research, training and educational exchange across cultures. Pandit Sundarlal Sharma Central Institute of Vocational Education also implements programs to build capacities of Tibet teachers across India. The trainers under any of the institutes need to fulfill the criteria in terms of professional expertise of 
knowledge about the domain. Pedagogic competence, given that knowing how to train is just as important as professional knowledge. By having a flexible training toolkit, trainers can apply those methods most effectively for the given training situation. Trainers' personality is also very important given that they impact the training. A good trainer are open, understanding, patient and have a strong sense of fairness. They enjoy working with young people and helping them grow professionally and personally. They also inspire trust in their trainees and know how to communicate clearly and constructively even in difficult varied situations. Personal suitability of trainer is also important given that they are working with young people. They must not have a criminal record or medical record in terms of drug abuse. The next important aspect for skilling ecosystem is how various activities have been financed right from mobilization of candidates, creation of infrastructure to certification and placement of candidates. Skill financing in India exhibits a multi-model structure. However, keeping the outcomes in perspective, there are two major categories, direct funding, Funds mobilized directly to the skill provider for infrastructure capacity creation through varied instrument such as debt, grant, equity or hybrid. Indirect funding, funding the training cost of the candidate in the form of grant, reimbursement to training provider, central and state government schemes, CSR project and offering skill loans to the learners at subsidized rates on the lines of education loan. The current financing structure by both government and private sector includes direct and indirect instruments of financing. Let me first discuss the direct instruments. When it comes to government, government is providing grants for innovative and socially motivated initiatives for infrastructure development to training institution like ITIs, industrial training institutes, debt for long-term debt financing, for setting up training infrastructure through National Skill Development Corporation like Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Kendras in all the provinces of the country. The private sector provides equity support investment by private equity and venture capital funds. For example, Acumen India, Suzane and Michael Dull Foundation, debt in terms of term loan and working capital financing via banks and non-banking financial companies to the skill providers on a case-to-case -case basis by National Skill Development Corporation. Under partner-to-partner -partner basis funding, there is no dedicated product for the sector. For example, Indian School Finance Company Private Limited lent secured and unsecured loans to vocational institutes. The last but not the least funding mechanism under the direct instrument is the CSR funding for infrastructure by way of soft loans and grants through CSR initiatives. There are Indirect instruments also, which are used both by the government and the private sectors for funding skilling initiatives. Under the government sector, candidate training cost via sponsorship, via state and centrally managed schemes such as Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, Nai Manjil are provided by way of grant. There are debt instruments also used wherein Candidate financing is done through Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Rin Yojana. Funds are also provided for entrepreneurship development through the credit guarantee schemes such as Mudra Loans and the Credit Guarantee Fund Trust for micro-small enterprises. Private sector also uses indirect 
instruments for financing skill training, debt for meeting training cost through candidate loans by banks, non-banking financial companies and micro-financial institutions. The skill loans given by banks or NBFCs range from Indian rupee 5000 to Indian rupees 150,000. There are technology based fintechs who are providing peer to peer lending platforms such as Fair Assets FinSquare. Under the CSR funding, training cost sponsorship is provided under CSR initiatives from large corporate, be it Infosys or Tata. However, there are challenges in attracting the investment for the infrastructure development. NSDC has recently launched Skill India Impact Bond through Global Partner Coalition to support young people in India, 60% of whom will be women and girls and provide them with skills and training in access to wage employment in sectors including retail, apparel, healthcare and logistics. The coalition for skill impact bond comprises HRH Prince Charles British Asian Trust, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, the Children Investment Fund Foundation, HSBC India, JSW Foundation and Dubai Cares with FCDO UK Government and USAID as technical partners. The collaboration amongst global partners aims at building capacity of India's skilling and pivot ecosystem through knowledge exchange and promoting good practices. The stakeholders would work towards promoting effective interventions, supporting research and enhancing the impact of the skill development program. There are private equity and venture capital funds are also available. The education sector has steadily attracted the attention of large private equity and venture capitalist funds. These investments help the service providers attain funds at a lower cost. Moreover, the expertise of the private equity and venture capital investors can be leveraged in the long term by the partners. The preferred instrument for investment by Private equity and venture capital fund is equity. However, debt and convertible debt based investment have seen a rise recently. This form of debt currently accounts for less than 5% of the country's annual venture capital flows but is growing rapidly with the entry of new players. Next is venture partner investment in talent sprint. Unitas Seed Fund investment in I-Star and Acumen and Insider investment via Series A funding in Edubridge are some of the examples of private equity and venture capital activity in the vocational education space in India. The private equity and venture capital fund investment benefits not only training partners but also invested into the online test preparation platform Topper. Skill vouchers have also been introduced to incentivize the youth for skilling. Students can pay for the course through voucher and choose the course and institute of their choice. The redeemable value of these vouchers or wallets will depend on the course opted by the candidate. The vouchers can be either completely or partially redeemable basis the sector of choice. There is support from multilateral and bilateral agencies also in strengthening the skill ecosystem in India. Various multilateral and bilateral agencies such as World Bank, ADB, DFID have extended financial and technical support to various central government ministries implementing bodies like NCVET, NSDC, Sector Skill Council, State Skill Development Mission. Skill strengthening for industrial value enhancement and skill acquisition and knowledge awareness 
for livelihood promotion are World Bank's supported projects for strengthening of skill ecosystem and boosting the Skill India mission. The fund flow mechanism involves multiple stakeholders such as the Government of India, state governments, ministries. There is support from social and private foundations also to learning providers in promoting the skilling and livelihood initiatives. Some of the foundations involved in skilling and livelihood promotion are United Way Worldwide, Greater Impact Foundation, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, American Indian Fund and CT Foundation among others. What emerges is that industry have a critical role in skill development as they are the ultimate beneficiaries. Having discussed the role of industry through CSR in financing various initiatives, let me discuss how industry is helping in developing market relevant training product and development of infrastructure. Industry partnership in India, the first effort to bring on board industry in skilling was the incubation of sector skill councils as sector eight company or a society by National Skill Development Corporation. Through these, it brought together all the stakeholders, industry, labor, and the academia. These play a vital role in bridging the gap between what the industry demands and what the skilling requirements ought to be. The National Occupational Standard is one of the most significant contribution of the Sector Skill Council. National Skill Development Corporation provided initial seed funding to facilitate their growth and enable them to achieve self-sustainability in a time-bound manner. These Sector Skill Councils are mandated to perform the function of identification of skill development needs, including preparing a catalog of types of skills, range and depth of skills to facilitate individuals to choose from them. They also help in development of sector skill development plan and maintaining skill inventory, determining the skills competency standards and qualifications and getting them notified as per NSQF. The Sector Skill Council also helps in standardization of affiliation, accreditation, examination and certification process in accordance with National Skill Qualification Framework as determined by NSQC. The Sector Skill Council may also conduct skill-based assessment and certification for qualifications or NOSES aligned training program as per their recognition by NCVET. Participation in the setting up of affiliation, accreditation, examination and certification norms for their respective sectors and training provider is an added responsibility. They also plan and facilitate the execution of training of trainers along with National Skill Development Corporation and states. They promote academies of excellence, paying particular attention to the skilling needs of ST, SCs, differently abled minority with a view to bring about inclusivity. SSEs also ensures that persons trained and skilled in accordance with the norms laid down are assured of employment and decent wages. To facilitate employment, sector skill councils have been encouraged to develop their own placement portal and mobile apps. These portals are linked to demand aggregation and are aimed at meeting the skill needs of the industry. The 360 degree interface of the portal connects candidate and training partners with recruitment firms and potential employers. Some of the SSEs have already started using such portals while a few others are in the process. There are various models for industry participation in the skilling ecosystem which are in vogue in India. 
first such model is wherein the industry sponsor candidates for skill development through contribution to national skill development fund or national skill development corporation to meet and fulfill corporate social responsibility commitments under the companies act corporate social responsibility act 2013 coal india limited has provided huge funds for such sponsorship sponsoring candidates for skilling programs in priority areas or sectors programs which focused on livelihoods persons with disabilities minorities special areas in geographical area as suggested by concerned company there are offer existing facilities and machinery for on the job training wherever available they also undertake short term training of fresh candidates or recognition of prior learning certification program for employees including contractual workers for nsqf alignment the second such model is setting up of centers of excellence or multi skill centers setting up centers of excellence in sector or areas of strategic importance with advanced infrastructure for high level training such as asap in kerala has set up kerala community skill parks or center of excellence in ar and vr they are also setting up corporate owned multi sectoral skill training center institutes like indian institute of skills by tata at mumbai and ahmedabad they also focus on training of trainer training of assessors programs specialized programs focused on high skilled trades they facilitate establishment of collaboration with foreign partners to develop transnational standards through government to government business to business partnership with the support of national skill development corporation another mechanism is by co-branding center or institute with skill india mission they utilize csr funds and dovetail them with government schemes like pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana for sponsoring of candidates wherever applicable the third such model is the industry supports trade specific labs or centers in the training institutions the corporate set up donate labs to support skill development programs addressing industry needs for skilled manpower at trade level for example centurion university has got labs from yama and volvo the corporates are also jointly monitor to ensure that such centers are delivering as per the plan and on quality and standards which have been set forth by the industry partner they also converge with government schemes like pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana in such centers to offset the cost of training and assessment they ensure continuous engagement through technology and knowledge interventions on the job training apprenticeship programs for graduate the fourth such model is right to use the land building machinery by the training partner the industry provide right of usage to an appropriate facility to be used as a skill development center the industry also support existing programs through basic setup cost and equipment donation to offset training programs that are cost intensive one such example is donation by honda motors to nizamuddin iti for the automotive sector they also provide land usage for specific programs like driver training centers construction related trade etc with high employment potential maruti has done such work in ahmedabad and larsen and turbo has provided facilities for construction sector industries are also utilizing csr funds for apprenticeship training under skill training as per the mandate making available machine and other equipment for training 
Another model that industries are following is setting up a skill development organization or a business unit. They set up a skill development organization either as a new business unit, independent trust, society or a newly incorporated special purpose vehicle with equity infusion from parent entity and or promoters or trustees. They access fund from NSDC on subsidized terms and become a non-funding training partner where funding is not sought. The sixth such model is wherein dual skill training is provided. Herein, industries are partnering with government and private ITIs for conducting training programs under high employability courses so as to fulfill their skilled manpower requirement. Under the program, the theoretical training is imparted through industrial training institutes and practical training imparted through the industry. Dual skill training helps enable industry linkages and provide hands-on experience to students on industry's latest and updated technologies. With a vision of strengthening industry linkages and acquainting students in industrial training institute with latest technologies used in the industry, industrial training institutes are encouraged to participate in the dual skill training program so that these industrial training institute trainees are industry ready. All affiliated industrial training institutes, whether government or private, can conduct training under dual skill training in their relevant affiliated trades. Engineering industry must have 40 employees and non-engineering 6 for conducting training under dual system of training. The dual system of training has been expanded to all the trades including service sector trades and trades in new and emerging sectors. All these courses will be NSQF aligned. The last model that is being followed in India is the model of Flexi Memorandum of Understanding with the industry. Flexi MOU is designed to cater to the needs of both industry as well as trainees. It allows industries to train candidates as per their skill set requirements and provide trainees with an industry environment aligned with the market demand and latest technology to undergo training. Employer with established infrastructure, robust training facilities as well as trained faculty can conduct in-house skilling of prospective employee to add industry-ready trainees to its workforce. Industry can create tailored skilling programs with customized courses having market relevant content that meets the industry requirements. The curriculum of courses can be developed by ITP designed with more weightage towards industrial training. Industry conducts practical and formative assessment and evaluation. The training in industry level courses with high employment potential an interaction with the experienced industry expert and professionals give exposure to industry shop floor environment and latest equipment. Increased employment revenues in multiple industries in that sector. Industry ready exposure to best practices, latest machines, tools and equipments. Having discussed the mechanics of the Indian skill ecosystems in terms of its regulatory framework, in terms of skill financing, various programs that are being run for training of trainers and how industry are participating, what are the models adopted, the key takeaways from this masterclass is that India has the opportunity to be the skill capital of world when other economies are aging. There is access to holistic and lifelong learning is must in changing world of work. Quality assurance and not quality control of skills is the need of the hour. The independent regulatory system ensures clarity of functions, better outcomes and efficiency in 
training. Better information dissemination facilitates choice-based system for all stakeholders, including trainees. Self-regulated ecosystem to inculcate a culture of self-monitoring and improvement. Nationally integrated education and competency-based quality assurance framework would facilitate mobility. Qualified and accredited trainers are the cornerstone of quality skilling. Multi-model skill financing improves availability of financial resources. Industry plays a very critical role in reducing skill gap, skill mismatch and skill shortages. I thank Mrs. Sunita Sanghi for such an enriching session providing insight into the skills mechanics, quality assurance, industry partnerships and other important aspects related to the skills ecosystem. I am sure the takeaways from this session such as holistic and lifelong learning, better information dissemination, training by industry, multi-model skill financing and self-regulated ecosystem will go a long way in enhancing the quality of skilling. I express my deep sense of gratitude to the Australia India Institute and the Australian Government, Department of Education and NEPA for the support for the master class. I also thank CIET and CRT for providing technical support in recording and editing of the master class. We close the session now. Thank you all. Once again, goodbye.